grandfather written by Omer Madison Kim. You all know Omer Madison Kim from our previous discussions about his political career, but we're just now going to learn about some of his other endeavors, including his love for poetry, which passed down to his generations. And also, uh, later on, we're going to be talking about um, the genealogical history that he presented for his family. So today we're going to read the story called, or the poem called My Ancestors, which was taken from the genealogy he wrote. Um, he liked to put a lot of his thoughts into poem, and this is what I would consider an epic poem, tracing his understanding of his genealogical record of the chem side of his family and in his genealogy he traces four different branches of his family so we're going to read a poem entitled my ancestors by omer madison chem when the years were dim and it was thought a sin to disobey the heathens god there was a tribe of men i know not just when that traversed Etruria's sod. The lay of this land, by the atlas at hand, is located about halfway between the Adriatic Sea, where the winds blow free, and the Tyrrhenian waves so green. The origin of these men is not told by pen, for that was so long ago. No writings go back to tell of that fact, but they left records that prove it so. On Italy's terrain, again and again, they left marks of their brain and hand that in various ways tell of the days when they resided in that land. They made their mark in ages dark before book or pen were known, and we read their fate at this late date as recorded in clay and stone. The ancient vase as made by this race is indeed of the rarest kind and shows a skill that displays a will backed up by a master mind. Not only on the vase did the Etruscan race leave the touch of a vanished hand, but the research that led to the tombs of their dead revealed markings that were true and grand. In the sepulchres of the tribe that long since dried were found parts of their ancient dialect, the same that the sages in later ages used in the Roman alphabet. They dwelt in caves, down close by the waves, or in clefts in the mountainside. They meandered by the streams of the valley's terrain, and caught fish on the incoming tide. They slew the deer with bow and spear, and broiled its flesh o'er the coals. They tanned its pelt, as soft as felt, and this clothed them from crown to soles. Their numbers increased and never ceased to swell the human tribe, till later they found in their homes underground there was no longer room to abide. And we will see that by degree they were forced to change location, and how the god of fate at a later date made of them one great nation. In the earliest days most crude were their ways, and in number they were but few. Just one tribe, and though many died, it grew and grew and grew, till their numbers were so great, I have to relate, they scattered far and wide, and became a band that filled the land from the Adriatic to the other side. We further find many marks left behind. They were artistic in their day. They carved wood and stone and the mammoth's bone, and were also molders of clay. As the days moved on in the years that are gone, woven together in the womb of time. They improved in art from the very start till their work indeed was fine. As their numbers grew, their minds did too, and they were inclined to be aggressive, disposed to take what they could not make, for most happy were they in the possessive. These men of old were warriors, bold, and were always ready to fight for their alter fires or carnal desires regardless of wrong or right in time this tribe was compelled to divide because of difference in opinion about the man that ruled the clan and over it exercised dominion as they could not agree you can well see and it must be clear to you that in seeking relief 
each selected a chief, and thus the tribe became two. There was no strife, nor loss of life, no quarrels, nor deadly battles. The division pleased all, both great and small, and each kept their goats and their cattle. They had changed their ways from former days and no longer lived underground, but now pitched their tents wherever they went, and it was a much better way they found. In the course of events, while they lived in tents pitched by rippling streams, they pastured their goats, their cattle, and shoats, thus realizing a pastoral dream. They grew in numbers which in time worked wonders and irrevocably fixed their fate, for they repeated the division I have already given, which led to a federal state. From tribes of two to twelve they grew, like Hebrews of the same creation. They then ceased to wander hither and yonder, and became permanent as one nation. They were composers of ditties and builders of cities. Each tribe built one of its own, and they built them well, as the remains now tell, for they built them of lime and stone. They built their homes on rocky domes far above the valley's floor, where they resisted attack from the front and the back for hundreds of years or more. Then, not far away, as the historians say, the city of Rome was founded, which fixed the date of the Etruscans' fate, and the crack of their doom was sounded. This city's might was not then in sight, it was only the germ of creation. Set by the Tiber, it grew longer and wider the center of the Italian nation. It extended then wide on either side, crossed many brooks and rills, and in the course of time, in that sunny climb, encompassed the seven hills. For a century or more, as stated before, the Etruscans successfully withstood the Roman legions when invading their regions and expelled them as they should. But there came a time that marked the decline of Etruria's power to resist. And it was thus her fate, at a later date, to yield to Rome's mailed fist. Never again was Etruria the same in power as an Etruscan state. By town and castle she became Rome's vassal and shared a Roman's fate. What was that fate? It is not too late to search time's scroll unfurled and find in bold relief that an Etruscan chief once ruled the Roman world. They might have been knaves, but never were slaves to serve as a menial race. They mingled with Rome as if they were home and maintained a dignified place. The civilization of the Italian nation they absorbed and assimilated well, till in thought and deed, hope or creed, no difference could anyone tell. If you now go back a long time's track to days much nearer the start, before they were wise to the nature of the skies and were somewhat crude in art, at this time, if you search, you will find they wore a kind of ornament as a charm to shield them from harm and evade the devil's torment. Bulla was the name of this charm on a chain which attached it to its owner, and if it performed as well as the legends tell, the charm was no misnomer. This historian knows, and this story shows, that before they were a nation, the, this name was applied to distinguish a tribe from others of the same federation. As time went on, the tribes were now gone, swallowed up by a great federation. No name applied to any tribe, for they were all a part of one great nation. When tribal life became no longer rife, they ceased to play that game. It was then the belief that the patriarch chief assumed Bulla as the family name. Years went by beneath Italy's sky while these events were taking place. Great changes were wrought as Etruria's tribes fought to save the name of their vanishing race. 
It's long been told how Etruscans bold struggled preserving this name, which finally was absorbed by the Italian horde and was lost to them in the game. Their tribal life, now together with strife, was gone with tribal love, with no tribal clan to hold each man close to the place of his birth, the minds of some began to run towards the ends of the earth. Nor did they act as a body compact in matters pertaining to self, but scattered abroad of their own accord in an effort to accumulate wealth. Thus, we find of the Etruscan kind, one left his country and home, wandered away for many a day, and in foreign lands did roam. Search history well, and you'll find it will tell of descendants of this early tribe who took a big chance, migrated to France, and thereafter continued abide. It also records that a bullet named George, no doubt a descendant of the other, lived there as well, but it does not tell if he had a sister or a brother. History has shown that the Church of Rome murdered many kith and kin because they did not believe what the Church conceived to be an unpardonable sin. Soon after this event of dire portent, the day of St. Bartholomew, long dead, the few that survived after many had died across the channel to England then fled. When these Huguenots fled from the land where they bred across the channel to Dover, they reached British soil where they then had to toil and begin their lives all over. About this time and in the same clime among whom there was not a landholder, history records a bullet named George, a subject of Parliament, as soldier. From that time on, whether right or wrong, he was subject to Parliament's demand when it invaded the wild of the Emerald Isle with Oliver Cromwell in command. The invasion was made and never stayed till every hamlet and castle and every face of the Celtic race had become an English vassal. When the race was subdued and in a passive mood, willing to obey Cromwell's command, it may seem phony, but England was out of money and paid her soldiers in Irish land. George took the land as it was the only pay at hand, which lay in the north of the isle, thinking no doubt that he'd just scout about and only remain for a while. Just how it came about, I am somewhat in doubt as to the details true, but a maiden fair with raven hair and eyes of Irish blue crossed his vision like a dream from heaven in the days of his early youth, but to him now weaned, it was no dream, just the reality of eternal truth. You would be wise if you dared to surmise this, that this was the reason why he was willing to abide with the conquered tribe and remain there till he died. I am pleased to confess that this is not all guess, neither a fib nor sham, for history relates this connection with dates that he located near the town of Lurgan. The name of his wife I don't know for my life, for it's one thing history is concealed, but that he had kitties, both Mickeys and Biddies, the records have clearly revealed. How many there were, we can only infer, but we know there were two, to be honest. Catherine was one history did not shun, and the name of the other was Thomas. It seemed the fate of George and his mate to worship the Protestant's God, to live and die neath the Irish sky, and be buried neath Ireland's sod. Likewise, the fate of Thomas and Kate, the children of the above-named pair, they lived and died on the other side, and their remains lie resting there. 1738, that's the year with the recorded date that Thomas Jr., the son of Thomas, joined a religious band that invaded the land and was confirmed by right and promise. This religious band that invaded the land in the interest of their maker was opposed to strife or the taking of life, and its common name is Quaker.
One should relate that soon after this date, Thomas changed his location and crossed the tide with intent to abide in America with its mixed population. When I said this he did, I tell you no fib, for the records of that time say he reached America's shores on or before 1739. According to the story, old and hoary, as told by the church's scribe, Pennsylvania is the state where he met his fate, for there's where he found his bride. There with his bride he lived till he died after 1772, and they then left a son as his father had done, which granted is nothing new. The father's son's name was just the same as that of his worthy sire, and in searching one finds that it was the kind they seemed greatly to admire. There was Thomas the Senior and Thomas the Junior, then Thomas the Third in line, and every generation from the first creation had one or more in its time. I will give you my word that Thomas the Third was father of Thomas number four, and since that day I make bold to say that they've come since by the score. They have scattered wide from tide to tide from the lakes to Mexico, and some with that name, descendants of same, one meets wherever they go. Some in time have been doctors divine, and some have been doctors of law. Every now and then we meet doctors of men that live by the work of their jaw. Some till the soil, and with great care and toil they gather the golden grain. They plow and they sow, they reap and they mow, with too often the reward of Cain. I have heard it is said of those now long dead that they were warriors bold. They fought for their side, and many men died, but never did they fight for gold. Their time they freely gave to free the black slave, and many were dealt a sturdy blow. Another I know was willing to go across the blue ocean wide to prevent a human vulture from spreading German culture or the earth from side to side. They kept Kaiser Bill from working his will on the sons of men to come. By defeating his legions in foreign regions, they convinced him he was undone. I am pleased to know that this is so, that my family from time to time aided the fight that was for the right, which is always an act divine. As in the past, I hope it may last, this zeal to aid the just, and may none be found as this world spins round who fight for greed and lust. And that's a poem by Omer Madison Kem, who lived from 1855 to 1942. He was my great great grandfather and a U.S. populist congressman from Nebraska from 1890 to 1896. My name is Chris Christensen. I'm the great great grandson of Omer Madison Kem. And it's my honor and pleasure to bring this to you. Please like and subscribe our channel and check out all of our other videos. We've got lots more content coming on Omer Madison Chem. This is a slice of political history that you're seeing for the, some of the first time. So thank you and please like and subscribe our channel and check out our other videos.